to all FOSI committee and all participants. Welcome back to FOSI Talk From Home series. Uh, Melinda speaking here. It's my pleasure on behalf of FOSI committee to welcome you. And thank you for sparing your time tonight. Uh, we glad to inform you that we established the FOSI YouTube channel, uploaded all the videos from previous talk already, and don't forget to subscribe the channel and please enjoy the video. And for sure, today's talk will be uploaded as well after we discuss with Doc later on. And amid this COVID-19 outbreak situation, hope everybody doing well, stay at home and keep physical distancing. I would like to introduce the FOSI committee attending today's meeting. So we have Mas Ricky, our FOSI general secretary, and the rest will join us soon. Thank you for registering this uh, FOSI online talk by a Zoom webinar on Integrated Geohistory Analysis. This will be an interesting topic that we would like to discuss tonight. Very excited to share with you uh, the registered participants uh, reach beyond our limit. Thank you very much. So I would like to extend my gratitude to our sponsors, Nobel Energy Resources and Geoscience Delta Andalan for funding the Zoom platform. And we are honored to have again Douglas Waples uh, tonight. He's a geochemistry expert from Serious Exploration Geochemistry. Many publications and many papers that we see from though. Uh, so let me share with you a bit about his presentation today. So we'll be talking about uh, integrated geohistory analysis as well as the geohistory plot. Uh, this integrated geohistory techniques uh, links global, regional, and local tectonics with sedimentology, biostratigraphy, petrophysics, geochemistry, paleoclimate, and geothermics, etc. And geohistory plots uh, are more than just a pretty wallpaper or cover illustration for reports. So they would become uh, any curious and creative geoscientist feature bread and butter. So this will be interesting talk as well. Uh, this one is a unique and powerful technology that will drive creative exploration. Uh, well, before I hand over to Douglas Waples, please allow me to give you some rules in order to make this meeting running smoothly. I would like to get your attention for a moment. I recommend all participants to mute the audio and switch off your video during explanation from presenter to maintain good connection. The presentation may be recorded for rescreening within the FOSI platforms. The third one, a Q&A box can be found in the icon panel, usually at the bottom of your screen. Enter your name for the committee to collate for after the presentation. It will be answered live uh, later on by Douglas Waples. Later on, you might turn on your audio and video to deliver your questions. We will have a break in the middle of presentation for a moment then. Uh, please alert me, though, whenever you want to stop the presentation for a short break. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Yes, though? I said uh, I will. Yeah. Uh, hope everybody uh, happy with that. And to all participants, please enjoy your time for this talk. And to Douglas Lopez, uh, please welcome uh, to deliver your presentation. Thank you, Melinda. Okay. Um, and uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you for uh, attending this. I hope it will be exciting, interesting, and maybe even that may change your lives a little bit. Uh, my main topic is introducing you to something you probably never heard of before called Integrated Geohistory Analysis, or IGA. And I'm going to enter the topic a little bit indirectly. I'm going to start by introducing an important word to you. You may or may not know it. It's narrative. There's much talk today in many parts of the world about the creation of narratives, which basically means stories. In other words, people have found out it's a very good way to focus your thinking and also to communicate. And so we're going to be showing how IGA can become a major force in creating narratives, and those narratives in turn can become important for petroleum exploration. 
My starting thesis is that basin modeling, of which IGA could be considered to be a part, and basin modeling rebranded as petroleum systems modeling in recent years, has not fulfilled its potential as a generator of narratives. Now, to be fair, it wasn't defined as a generator of narratives, but the fact is it hasn't moved in that direction. And I believe that the geoscience community is hungry for more and better narratives that can generate exploration, enthusiasm, and ideas. So that is where we're going to be going today. How do we generate narratives, and how can those narratives help us in exploration? You haven't heard of IGA before because it's quite new, just a few months old actually, but it has actually rather deep roots, 50 years or so. Going back to 1971 to the invention of the burial history plot by Lopatin in the Soviet Union, followed just a few years later by the invention of geohistory plots by Professor Van Hinta in the Netherlands. And then there was another paper just four years after that, still in the very early days, by none other than Peter Vail, who, whose name everyone knows, discussing the great potential and bright future for geohistory. But unfortunately, that paper was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which no one ever reads, and so it disappeared and really never evolved into anything. So it was a false evolutionary start. In fact, I sort of rediscovered or reinvented the wheel about the year 2000 when I started on what would turn out to be IGA. And the first time I presented this publicly was in 2002 in Denmark when I was asked by Maersk, for whom I was working, to talk to some university students. And I entitled my talk, The Hidden Benefits of 1D Maturity Modeling. In 2013, more than a decade later, I first published these ideas under the same title. And in the same year, we released our Nova software, which was designed in part to facilitate IGA. But the name IGA still didn't exist. We were still calling it maturity modeling. And I finally decided it was different enough from any other aspect of basin modeling, and certainly different enough from traditional 1D modeling, that it deserved a name that would be disconnected from old, perhaps negative, or perceived to be outdated uh, names. And I called it integrated geohistory analysis, where the core of this is the word geohistory. So we are going to learn about geohistory plots, how to make them, and how to use them. And the whole point of this is we're not only going to learn about geohistory plots, how to build them, and the basics of interpretation, but we're going to learn how to generate narratives from them. And the uh, slides, the illustrations of modeling output, in this talk, all from our Nova software, the patents bear maybe even have drawn. In a burial history plot, the datum is sea level at each moment, and so the upper surface is a flat line at a value of zero. A, geo, a burial history plot is very powerful compared to what we had at that time 50 years ago, which was essentially nothing, because it allowed to people to look at the progression of time, the evolution of a basin or a location through time. And this was mind-blowing, literally, to a lot of people. But a few years later, Van Hinta, who's... Um, History was not in modeling or in geochemistry, but rather in biostratigraphy. Uh, 
developed a geohistory plot in which the datum was different. The datum, not the top of the solid rock, as in the burial history plot, but the surface of the ocean. So we see here, we now in the cyan color are depicting the ocean, and we can see the rock layers going up and down, not just with burial and erosion, but also with changes in water depth or changes in elevation. As we see over on the left here, we even have a time period when it was very slightly emergent, so it goes above sea level. And Van Hinkle is smart enough to intuitively realize that this was potentially powerful, but he didn't have an ongoing interest in um, maturity modeling. And unfortunately, no one in the field of maturity modeling at that time really understood very much about what to do with all these wonderful data. And so geohistory plots languished without much attention for quite a long time. Finally, recently, I recognized that we could amend the original geohistory plot to what I call a eustatic geohistory plot. And I may or may not be the inventor of this. I'm not aware of anyone else who has done it. But here our datum is present day sea level, so that we now see that the datum surface is not flat. And we can look at sea level going up and down, so now we are getting more power in our interpretation, in that we can begin to discuss eustatic versus tectonic events. And so this is where I would like to start today, is to make the point that the standard geohistory plots with a flat top surface are old fashioned and they're lacking something that we can use and make uh, work for us. Instead, I strongly recommend uh, creating eustatic geohistory plots. Another point to make about IGA is that it operates on several different scales simultaneously. From the plate tectonic or even global scale, to regional, to basin, to play, and even to prospect scale. And it's not an either or situation. If you're interested in a prospect, you need to know the plate tectonic and regional and basinal settings as well. So we will be operating simultaneously on several different scales and we'll have to adjust our objectives and our application um, to view it on a prospect scale, new ideas and relationships from it. As an example of this, here we have the subduction of the old Farallon plate under the west coast of North America. As we see the Pacific Ocean in blue here and North America today in green. Subduction from the west. That is our plate tectonic setting for discussing the effects of this subduction. And then we can make that a time-dependent phenomenon, which is shown by this series of eight maps, in which the details of the subduction are reconstructed at different times. We're not just saying, well, we just uh, do subduction and it's all the same. We're trying to personalize it through time to, again, create a scenario that is as accurate as we possibly can. And then on another scale, we can now look at the results of this with our severe fold and thrust belt, our Laramide Thorland province here, our magmatic events back in the back arc setting, and so on. And the beauty of this is now we're going from a global scale to a much more basinal scale and we also are seeing the relationships among the different basins, the Uinta Basin, the Green River Basin, the Powder River Basin, the DJ Basin, and so on. 
So we can see how each of these relates to the plate tectonic setting that we've put in. If we go further south into Mexico and Central America and look at the same phenomenon, this is a little bit later in time. This is uh, really in the tertiary. But we see the Cocos Plate, which is a daughter plate from the destroyed Farallon Plate, subducting under the western margin of Mexico, creating a fold belt, the Chiapas fold belt here, and how that will relate to the Sureste Basin here in uh, the southern Gulf of Mexico. So we've now moved down a level to talking about not just basins, but a specific basin. And beyond that, we can go to the individual well, which will be our basic unit that we're working in. We build 1D models, one at a time, at all the locations we want to investigate. In addition to working on multiple scales at the same time, IGA operates simultaneously in multiple scientific areas, mainly geology, but also using chemistry in the sense of geochemistry. Most of it is organic geochemistry, but other types may be also. And physics, the various aspects of geophysics from petrophysics, to a reflection seismic and sequence stratigraphy and so on. So we have to be cognizant that our results will depend on our skill in taking fruit from all of these di different areas and making a tasty fruit salad out of it. In addition, we have a lot of different topics that would be valuable for us. And good uh, IGA work is going to use as much of this information as we can possibly get our hands on. That means, again, you've got to learn some new skills or get a lot of emails and uh, connections to people who can help you. Uh, so one of these is isostasy, which is something that most geologists don't pay a lot of attention to. But when you're talking about understanding basin evolution, it is extremely important. And you need it if you're going to create a eustatic geohistory plot. Another is eustacy. You've got to have a eustatic sea level curve. And here's the one that we have, one of the ones we have built into NOVA, which demonstrates the importance. We're talking about potential variations of up to a couple of hundred meters or maybe even a little more. And so this is not a, a super weak force in all cases. Uh, to illustrate this, here we have a, a eustatic geohistory plot. And this plot has a red line across it, which is our tectonic subsidence. We see here a curve which has a deepening of the water from original basin formation to present, and then a shallowing of the water during infilling of the basin after a long period of sediment starvation. And the tectonic subsidence relates, and the shape of all these curves relate to isostasy and also to our concepts of water depth through time. So how did I know what water depth history I wanted to put on this? Well, there's a number of ways you can get data like this. In NOVA, we have five different ways you can enter data. And I've just put on here in red, these, this option would be for data basically from biostrat analysis. These would be more from geological analysis. This could be from rifting subsidence theory because it would be thermal and tectonic uh, events uh, and how they affect water depth. And paleo elevation is a difficult one because we often have very little evidence, but there often can be bits and pieces that we can use, as I'll show you later. So 
being an omnivore, eating all kinds of data that may be valuable is extremely important. This is an example. In the previous well that I showed you, we have some relatively young biostrat data reported as age ranges, like inner neuritic, outer neuritic, upper bathial, and so on. And you see a trend of data here in younger times. Then we have a huge gap before we have a little bit of information back in the early history, back in the Jurassic for this area, for shallow water depth or even non-marine. So how do we take these data and put them together to make a story? This just um, makes that point. I'll get back to the answer to that question a little bit later, but before I do, I want to say that another type of valuable information that we have is sedimentation and erosion rates. Not because we ever enter these as rates, but because we enter the thicknesses and ages that allow us to the rates. And once we've calculated them, we can use them to control our data. We're high, like here and here, extremely high here. And so we would conclude that probably there's either an increase in accommodation space at those times or there's an increase in sediment supply. So now we've, we're on the trail uh, to figuring out how to understand these. But just a word of caution here. This plot here, this particular event has a large uncertainty. It shows a very high sedimentation rate. But a sedimentation rate is a thickness divided by a duration in time. And if the duration is short, we will usually have a pretty large uncertainty in percentage about the duration of that event, and that can lead to some strange uh, sedimentation rates, particularly very high ones. So don't take these numbers always too literally. This is where this technology can be valuable for quality control because you could say only allowed 200,000 years short. Maybe we should think a reasonable rate for sandstone deposition is 250 meters per million years, and so it should be 600,000 years instead of 200,000 years. So that type of thinking can come out of an analysis of this type of data. We also can look at rate, uh, rates of erosion. All of the blue arrows here indicate erosional events with re relatively slow erosion rates in this case. That probably suggests they're not very interesting, very important. It might even argue that they're maybe controlled by used to see or very mild local tectonics rather than something bigger. But here, more recently, we see the situation is a little different. We've moved into a longer period with slightly higher proposed erosion rates, suggesting that this event or these events here may be a bit different in character. Another thing is paleo latitude. And we can easily reconstruct that using one of several uh, mapping, paleo map programs. Scotesis or the one from the G plates group at the University of Sydney. They well, I know if I change the latitude, it's going to change the surface temperature. So that's what we're after. And that is, in fact, one of the major uses of a latitude reconstruction in the field of basin modeling. But for IG, it's quite as interesting. This is from the Delaware Basin in West Texas. 
It's part of what is called the Permian Basin, and it, uh, its paleo latitude history is shown by the purple line. And Ten years, I've attempted to interpret it in terms of the tectonic. So what we see here is that South America first bumped into this part of Laurentia or North America almost 400 million years ago and did it again at this time. And this was the effective time that led to the real formation of Pangaea. And we've broken it down here into several events. This is when the continents came together and then in the Permian, they fell apart. And so we've got the Triassic rifting, formation of the North Atlantic, et cetera, et cetera. What I find interesting about this is that we see here it, the terrain is headed north at a fairly good rate. And then at about the time that South America hit North America, we see it stopped moving north. Okay, so we're forming Pangaea. But here's the interesting thing. When Pangaea fell apart, I'll bet you, like me, thought North America went back where it came from. That's the way I've always pictured the uh, old Yapetus Ocean closing and the Atlantic opening. But in fact, it didn't. The North America resumed marching north even faster than it was before. And so that tells us something about the dynamics deep in the earth where all these masses of plates had congregated into Pangaea. I, I doubt if people have thought much about that, and I'm not sure how useful it is, but it is the type of serendipitous discovery that we can make when we uh, analyze these different types of information carefully. Global climate is something else we want to worry about because eventually, not so much in IGA itself, but if we do any thermal modeling, we're going to be worried about subsurface temperatures and maturation. And so uh, global climate, we're going to need a global climate curve. This is NOVA's default curve through the Phanerozoic. Um, but you could use anything. The point is, think about it and do something. But something that most people miss out on is that if I say global climate changed by, let's say, three degrees, did it change by three degrees everywhere? The clear answer is no. It changes very little at the equator, from warm periods to cool periods but it changes a huge amount as we move toward the poles. That's what this diagram shows. The black parabola is a representation of the modern world. The red colors are when global climate was higher than it is now, and you can see the difference between the equator and the pole is very small in the really hot climates, whereas if the world cools, it moves to much, much greater differences. So we have to include that in our thinking about paleoclimate. And I just, even though geothermics is not in the main part of IGA, everything is connected, and so I want to say just a few words about geothermics right here, and then I won't do much with it after that. I already talked about surface temperature as a function of climate and paleo latitude, but it's also a function of water depth and elevation. And so what we will do when we've put in our data, our software will, will for us calculate a paleo seafloor or top of sediment uh, temperature. Some people call it SWIT, so sediment water interface temperature. And this is just shown as the type of thing we will always have for our models. 
um, you, just to make one more point, you can see that surface temperature does change through time. It generally changes a lot in most models that I've built, unless they're just a very short model in a place like Malaysia that for the last 30 million years has been basically in the same latitude. But if we start moving continents around and changing climate over long periods of time, you'll see that surface temperatures change a lot. We also have changes in heat flow as a result mainly of tectonic events and changes in the character and thickness of the lithosphere. This is just an illustration of a system with two rifts in it showing heat flow through time. And we can throw in some unusual events here. There are ways in modeling to include volcanism, which is an intense but local in time and space event shown here. And we can even model hot springs in which hot water is coming to the surface associated with some kind of volcanism. And so we've shown that period as an excursion from the normal background surface temperature to where near surface rocks are exposed to temperatures of maybe 80 degrees Celsius because you've got hot spring water flowing through them. Now the importance and commonness of these events is certainly open to question, but when you need this type of thing, you really need it. You can't do without it. So even if it's rare, it's still useful to be able to do that. And those are all things that are connected to IGA because they're connected to tectonics, and other things that we're already reconstructing for IGA. So I want to move a bit into uh, IGA analysis. Here we have a location in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. It's a eustatic geohistory plot. You can see that the cyan water surface here is indeed not flat. Um, but it's a relatively minor perturbation on this. This is a nice eustatic geohistory plot. You could see easily the ages and so on. You could see the uh, deepening of the basin with time. And then you can even see the termination of sedimentation here and the uplift and beginning of erosion. Okay, that's fine. But now let's throw in our tectonic subsidence curve. And now we can see, okay, we've got our tectonic subsidence that created the basin that we filled with sediments. And it's got a couple of little events. You see this event here where the sedimentation rate changed. That appears to be related to tectonics because it's not expressed at the surface. Um, we also see a little uplift here that's responsible for the recent uplift. So we can go ahead and start interpreting this uh, data set with just this basic information. But to help us with that, I found it useful to put overlays on my geohistory plots that represent, in most cases, uh, tectonic events things that are influencing the tectonics ups and downs, and also that may be related to changes in sediment supply, sediment type, and that sort of thing. There's no rule for what you put on or don't put on a plot. It doesn't have to be continuous. I've got a long period here that doesn't have an event in it. Uh, but it's a reminder about what was happening when and what was causing what, so that I can begin to discover undiscovered relationships. That's a large part of creating our narrative, is to discover ways of putting our information together in ways to create things that no one else has ever thought of. That's where the new ideas and the exploration successes are going to come from. 
Now, one of the things that we want to do when we're doing a 1D study usually is model multiple locations. And so here's a second model. The first one was what we call WN3, and this is BV2. Uh, and they look different. You could tell that quickly by the color differences. They've got some different strata in the models. They've got different thicknesses of the salt, for example, which is very thick in this one, and not very thick at all in this one, and so on. So they clearly differ. So I can begin to compare these and learn by comparing. But just a word of caution. There's something very dangerous about comparing this with this. And that is scale. If you're going to do visual comparisons, you need to be working on the same scale. This scale is very different from the previous scale. It went to 8,000 meters. This goes to 4,000 meters. So when I plot it properly on the correct scale, I see now the difference is quite a bit larger than I even suspected before. So, another reason we would want to uh, work with uh, IGA is to compare one area with another. In this case, we're going to compare the Anadarko Basin with the Permian Basin. Now, they're pretty close together, and they're very similar in age, and they're formed by parallel processes. So you might think they'd be almost perfect analogs for each other. And in some ways they are, some they aren't. Here is the Washita suture all along here. It actually has different names at different places, but certainly called Washita out in this area. And you see that the Anadarko Basin was right at this bend, whereas the Permian Basin is in a very different geometry. And so just looking at them like they were two different points along the same trend may be a mistake. We need to be very careful about that. So here's the Delaware Basin. Okay. It's one of the deepest basins. I think it might be the second deepest basin in North America. Uh, and it's called the Permian Basin because the bulk of the sediments, as you can see by the orange color, are of Permian age. Very famous, very productive for 100 years, etc. So we've got our reconstruction here with all our events. We've got our tectonic subsidence curve. We've got our uplift history during the tertiary etc. All of that is in there and that is ready for interpretation. We've also got the deposition of our Cretaceous section here after a long, long unconformity. Let's go to the Anadarko Basin. Here it is. You say, wow, that's deep. Hey, it's even deeper. They're on the same scale and it's even deeper than the Delaware Basin. It is, in fact, the deepest basin in North America. And you'll see the color is different. It's got some orange Permian, but it's got a lot of gray color down at the bottom uh, that is all Carboniferous. So what we see is the Anadarko Basin here, despite being similar in scale, roughly similar in age, is not exactly synchronous, and it clearly was not uh, generated by exactly the same forces. We do, however, see that the same events, the severe forend and the um, alaramide uplift have caused the subsidence that gave us our Cretaceous section. This one's a little thinner than in the uh, Delaware Basin, but they're very similar. It also has an uplift at the end, just like the Delaware. So we see important similarities and differences. And that is going to be the story of creating a narrative out of um, IGA data or information. 
We want to create a story that has as much detail as possible. Now, another thing we can bring into these is to, instead of putting only tectonic events, or instead of tectonic events, we could put something like sequences. Here we have the old Wheeler sequences from the late 1950s, where Harry Wheeler developed the foundation for sequence stratigraphy by dividing North America up into about seven sequences. And I've superimposed those and some tectonic information with it. So this is a hybrid representation that has some sequence um, thinking and it also has some tectonic thinking. If you don't like that mixture, you could create two of them, one that is based on tectonics and one that is related to uh, the sequencing. Anyway, this gives us new tools, a whole lot of new tools for understanding our history and making IGA relevant in not just basin modeling, not just maturity modeling, but in understanding the total geologic history. In fact, IGA becomes your principal toolbox for this. And biostrat, gross depositional environment, uh, sequence stratigraphy, and all of those other things can be linked to it, not in a particular hierarchy, they're all contributors, but the IGA is the hub because it has the tools to put it together in a picture form that people can understand and use. I want to go back to the Gulf of Mexico for a moment because there's another really important application of IGA, which is quality control. Now, in most cases, we go to our biostrat reports or we go to the literature and we get some words like lower bathial or some numbers like 50 meters. And that tells us our reconstruction of water depth or even elevation at different times. So we put those together. Now, here's a data set that has a bunch over on the right here in recent times, shallow water environments. They're a lot shallower than it actually is today. This is actually not super shallow, and it's definitely a lot deeper than these, okay? But what we see is after that, we have a deepening as we go back in the past, or better said, a shallowing as we move toward the present, that probably was largely controlled by sediment infilling, but could also have a tectonic component to it. Then as we move further out in the basin, all we have are lower bathial calls from the biostrat. And the problem with that is, as uh, Peter Vail noted in his 1982 paper, you don't have much resolution because the current range for lower bathial is 1,000 to 4,000 meters. So it doesn't really help us determine much about the water, specific water depth during this long period of 100 million years here. But we do connect back to relatively shallow water depths in the Jurassic. So what are we going to do with these data? Well, the first thing we can do is take them literally and put them together and see what happens. So we did this, and one thing you'll notice is that we have to have a major tectonic subsidence event to get the water deep here when it was shallow a little bit earlier. Okay, so that requires a tectonic event, and that turns out it's a problem here. The second thing is if we take all those data very literally, we wind up with a jagged uh, curve here. That's, that could easily be smoothed out because all of these are data ranges anyway. Um, but what we do see is that 
it's shallowing faster than sediment infilling can accommodate. Remember, when you put sediment in a basin, it pushes basement down because of the isostatic response. So it's tough to fill basins. So it's not that easy to say it got shallower entirely based on sediment inflow. We had to have some tectonic uplift here. Okay, that creates a second problem because we not only have a downward tectonic event, but we have an upward tectonic event that is spoiling things here. So what we did here was we took an alternate approach. We were suspicious about the quality of the uh, Biostrat data for a variety of reasons I won't go into, but that kind of detective work is very important to do and was critical in this case. And we said, well, let's suppose we didn't have any trustworthy Biostrat data. All we have is the present day water depth, and we have a pretty good idea from a lot of work elsewhere that this was shallow. But we know something about the history of this. This is the Gulf of Mexico, and we know a lot about the Gulf of Mexico rift. And so we can turn that into a model for the increase in water depth in a low sedimentation environment based on work that was published by Parsons and Slater in the late 1970s and proven to be very, very good. So this is what theory tells us our water depth history should look like. And that might be better than looking or working with questionable biostrat data. And when we put that in and put the whole story together, we have what I think is a really happy solution here. We've got a nice, smooth, red curve of tectonic subsidence that shows the effects of cooling. Rapid cooling early on and some tectonic subsidence as well, but rapid cooling of the rifted margin, slowing as it gets cooler. We have an infilling by the sediments. It takes us very nicely up to the present day water depth without it ever getting shallow. And what we think happened was that a lot of the biostrat, uh, the bugs they were using were reworked from shallow shellful environments of the same age, and they were not reflecting the water depth at this location. They were all um, uh, a lock finesse. And so, uh, this gave us an alternative to working with bad, bad data. It also shows that basin modeling or IGA should not be something that you do at the end of everything else just to calculate migration or maturity. It should be a part of the interview process, the thinking process, the model building process, because it can feed back a lot of good ideas. Just very quickly, the green rocks here, which don't correspond to any geologic age, represent a repeated little bit of a toe thrust here uh, related to salt movement. So uh, that's not very important part of the story here, so I won't go further with it. So this is just a reminder of what the Biostrat told us. This is what we wound up with. I feel personally like it's a much better model. Let's have a look at the North Sea and the Central Graben, which everybody's heard of. Everybody knows the Central Graben was formed in the Jurassic, Jurassic rifting of the North Sea. Uh, that's just a standard thought. So here's a model for the North Sea showing the Jurassic rifting as a tectonic subsidence event here. And you say, okay, that's great, uh-huh. And if you look at this a little more, you say, yeah, but what's all that stuff that happened before the Jurassic? And that's when you realize that this uh, area had a history. It was the Northern European, Northwest European basin in the Paleozoic. It was a major, major basin with its own history. 
And so that gives us insight because this was subsiding. It was a zone of weakness. And this rifting did not come completely out of the blue, out of nowhere. It was probably occurring on a zone of weakness that developed in previous 200 million years. So that helps us understand the context in which the central graben was born and evolved. It doesn't just start at the beginning of the Jurassic because somebody said nothing below the Jurassic is interesting. But when we look at the uh, tectonic subsidence curve here, we see some interesting things. Here's the rift and the drift. Okay, that's pretty good. Then we've got something else going on here. There's a rejuvenation or a new event here. This is pretty clear. And it's reflected in a big change in water depth here. So this is real, and that means this is an invitation for us to think about it, learn something, maybe develop a deeper understanding or a new idea. And simultaneously, we'll notice here that this rapid final infilling today, or very recently, of this basin into a shallow marine environment almost, uh, is not something that could be accomplished just by throwing in a lot of sediment. We put in a lot of sediment, but it wasn't enough to fill it. We still needed some tectonic uplift. So we've got an event here which created, it had tectonic uplift, but it probably also created a new supply of sediment here. So now we've got some talking points. We're going to put in a rifting event here. And then we're going to analyze this and at least give it some thought. I've just called it a continental sag basin, kind of like many of the basins on the Craton of North America that are of similar age. That seemed like a reasonable analogy to me. Um, and OK, so I've got the old part of the history put together. I mentioned this, this is some kind of folding event here, possibly up in southwestern Sweden, that uplifted a larger area and created a sediment source. But the most interesting part for me is this one. And you look at it and say, okay, that's in the Paleocene, and the water depth went from kind of outer shelf to bathial, okay? Well, if you look at it in detail, look at the uh, sediments, the layers uh, circled in red here, you notice those four are the famous North Sea chocks. So what we had going on during this time was deposition of the North Sea chocks right here. Okay, and we all know that chalk deposition terminated as shown here. It terminated suddenly. And what happened was we went from a moderate sedimentation rate that was almost all chalk to a very slow sedimentation rate, which was mostly clastic. In fact, mostly fine grain clastic. And that lasted for a while, a few million years these three stratigraphic units, and then suddenly the sediments arrived, increasing the sedimentation rate by almost a factor of 100. And so you notice that something has happened. And we also, um, well, yeah, we also notice that there's a significant portion of sandstone here. So this was just the re residual material that was accompanying the chocks. We took away the chalk and we're left with this fine grain material, very quiet environment. Right here, between Baldy and Horda time, we changed into an environment which was catching new sediment from a completely new source at a much higher rate with a lot of coarse clastic material. So a very different scenario. Um, 
And the final point to be taken from this is, this is all understandable. The end of chalk deposition and the arrival of the coarse grain sediment a little while later are related, I believe. There is tectonic activity that possibly wrench folding that allowed this area to sink to much greater water depths very quickly. The biological productivity of the coccolithophorids that produced the chalks went away. Nothing immediately replaced it. End of chalks, end of decent sedimentation, long hiatus during Lister to Balder time. And then, possibly as a result of the same tectonic event, the coarse sediments, perhaps from an area where in a wrench fault there was a porpoise structure where the block went up, whereas it went down here, that block went up and provided us a new source of sediment that was for some reason delayed in arriving here. So we can put it all together to tell a single story. How do we turn that into an exploration play or a new exploration idea? That's up to you. But we're now armed with the capability to do that. We have the tool chest and we only need the brains to know how to do it. Unconformities are the poor stepchild of geology. Nobody much likes them. Nobody's very interested in them because you've got nothing left. All you have is a hole or in your strat column. And it takes a lot of work, but I find it to be very fascinating. And therefore, I believe that unconformities offer us an incomparable and irreplaceable opportunity to learn about the integrated geologic history of our mind. So I love working with unconformities because it's fascinating, but also because it means I'm doing something that's potentially of great value that nobody else is doing, and it is the richest place to be looking for a treasure chest. So if you want a good future, become a, a specialist in understanding unconformity. Now in the, our study in the Permian Basin of West Texas, we had that unconformity between the um, Triassic non-marine section and the Cretaceous marine section. So we reconstructed it as a series of nine Cretaceous units with some short hiatuses between some of them and a final Paleocene unit we reconstructed the missing thicknesses by analogy, and then we eroded it because it's, we know what's missing today. Everything deposited during the green period from this time to here is missing today. Actually, deposition ended at 60 million years. We uh, removed it in two separate events. One was a relatively slow erosion that occupied most of the time and eroded about half of the section. The other half was eroded very quickly and very recently in the Great Plains uplift. Two very different tectonic events. That's the model that we, we created to do this and no one else had ever done this before for this area. Um, so we've got our 10 layers carefully put together over on the left. And then we've got our two erosional events on the right. Where we don't have as much detail, we could put it in, but it would be guessing. But we have enough detail to show that those two events are very different. The post laramide erosional event is seen as being the result of a relatively weak uplift whereas the Great Plains is seen as being the result of a much more important uplift at this location. It's not to say that all over the West, it was more important. And so let's look at this. I'm gonna move north to the Powder River Basin here. This is the same slide we saw before. And we've got the same events. We've got our Laramide uplift here. 
but it's a thousand kilometers or more away from the old one. And then we've got our Great Plains uplift. In between, we had a period where we're saying there was erosion and the, it was actually tectonically subsiding a little bit. So we've got a similar but somewhat different model for the erosion here. But I want to look at this in a little more detail because there's a lot of interesting information. We go from marine in the Cretaceous here to non-marine when we're depositing the Green River formation to non-marine, non-aqueous deposits to erosion. And the question is, when did this uplift occur? We've got it set up so that most of the uplift was very late and only minor uplift was early. And furthermore, when did the uplift start? Did it start before the Green River formation? Sorry, I've got the Green River. Green River's in this area. Uh, sorry, right in this area. Um, what we did was using data on macrofauna, the presence of land snails of certain types, and non-burrowing tortoises, that means they don't dig a hole in the ground and sleep during the winter, they're active during the winter, which puts a limit on the temperature. They can't be very cold. So that tells us that at this time, this was not high. Otherwise, it would have been too cold for these tortoises. The tortoises are like a land turtle. And, uh, and so that was what controlled our division of the uplift into a weak laramide and a strong Great Plains uplift. That little bit of data about the tortoises. But a benefit of doing this type of reconstruction is that you automatically are reconstructing for a series of wells a surface at different times the land surface. So here I've chosen a particular interval 29 million years ago, and I've plotted about 70 or 80 wells in the study in dots that show the elevation above sea level. And what we see is that there are two areas that appear to possibly have been of internal drainage, either forming lakes or coal swamps, this one and this one. And so that could potentially be helpful in identifying different facies and particularly in looking for source rocks. If we go further southwest from here, we find something called the Colorado Plateau. It's called that because of the Colorado River, which flows through it like that and makes the Grand Canyon down here. But we have our four states. Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico all come together at this point. We're going to look at a point about here, which is in um, the Colorado Plateau. Oops. Sorry. Um, here we are on the Colorado Plateau, and it looks very similar. We've got a laramide uplift. And we've got another uplift going on here. But it's a little different. The Great Plains uplift isn't shown as clearly. And we've got a thermal uplift because this is closer to the volcanism. So by learning about one basin, we're learning things that are importable to the next basin, but not exactly the same. So we've got our Laramide foreign basin and then our Laramide uplift and so on. But what I want to focus on here is this part. Where you see it going up, you see a funny little yellow thing here, and then you see it stops going up and actually starts coming down. But we see the tectonic uplift continuing up to present day. So what's going on here? Well, Again, crocodile fossils in the Green River Shale indicate a warm climate, mean annual surface temperature not lower than 23 degrees, and therefore lower at low elevation. That tells us the 
Lake here that gave us the Green River Shale was not up in the mountains. It was down very close to sea level. That's an important question that had not really been answered before. So then that's part of the story. It helps us control when the real uplift started. And in fact, I think it's very likely that the lakes ended because of uplift. The land surface was pushed higher and the things that, the dams that formed the lake disappeared or were broken and end of lake story. Now, the um, Colorado Plateau is hot. Here's the Four Corners area. This is a heat flow map. This area is all quite hot, and our study well is right in this area. So we could imagine that there could have been an appreciable thermal uplift at this location. So here's what we have as our next uplift event after the Laramie. The basin and range thermal uplift proposed to be fairly strong, and good evidence is shown by this yellow layer, which is basalt. It's about 100 to maybe as much as 200 meters thick there. It's preserved perfectly on the top of the mesas. We know it covered a huge area and was almost certainly at this location. It's gone today, however, through erosion undercutting and so on, that fell down and that revealed the softer rocks below which then could erode faster and so on. So let me go on to the next one. What we see here is that when the erosion starts going faster, it stops going up because erosion is now competing very well with tectonic uplift. We hit the Green River Formation, which is a cemented carbonate, and the rate of erosion slows down again until we cut through the Green River Formation, and then we get the Colorado River also cutting down, and so the erosion rate increases further bringing us to our present story. So we have all these different components here, slow erosion, faster erosion, a slowdown during the cemented carbonate time, then we move into the weaker uh, layers below it, and it slows down again because of the history. And this piece here, the rapid recent erosion, is proven by the long distance movement of huge boulders as much as two meters across that have moved as much as 15 kilometers. So uh, we can then adjust our model to show all these catastrophic events. I want to close this section with a very brief example from Indonesia, since I think you're probably all, or most of you are somewhat interested in that. I was asked to put together a quick IGA analysis in a frontier area. And we chose the Wiga Bay Basin offshore Halmahera in the e Eastern Indonesia. And I show you this because this is an area with no data, so it shows that we can get do this type of work, at least as a beginning, even in areas with little data. It also shows how quickly we can do this. This was a project that took me four to six hours. That's all. Here's where Rita Bay Basin is. Here's the island of Halmahera. Here's Sulawesi, which is better known. Here's the bird's head in Irian Jaya and here's the Wida Bay. Okay, so that's where we are. It's a very tectonically complex area. Here's the approximate location of this model right out in the middle of the basin. So you can see that our reconstruction not only doesn't have a lot of data, but it has a lot of complexity. And there's no chance I'm going to do the right model the first time I build one. 
but it's a beginning and um, any model that you build should be considered to be a work in progress rather than the final truth. So here we are, the center of the Wheda Bay Basin. Now, what do I have? I've got a bunch of tectonic events that I found in the literature that seem potentially relevant to changes in sedimentation rate and water depth that I was taking from the published uh, sources that I was given. I didn't have a lot of sources, and I can't say that it's all correct, uh, and it certainly isn't comprehensive, but it's a beginning. And what we see is here a proposal for deepening water, tectonic subsidence. By definition, this is a starved basin because we don't have enough sediments to keep it full. So the water depth is increasing. And then suddenly, we've got tectonic activity that pushes it up to a very shallow water environment where it stays for a long time, depositing the Miocene here in a shallow water environment, and then it deepens again. Okay, well, I have faithfully put this together, but as I look at it later, I want to tell you there's something about it that bothers me a lot that I am going to change if I go to work on this again. And that is, I don't like coincidence and I don't like miracles in my reconstruction. We have here a miracle. We go from deep water to shallow water, staying shallow for a long time, almost 10 million years, without becoming an unconformity. Now, what are the chances that the tectonic forces uplifting here were exactly the right amount to push that up into this shallow water zone and keep it there for a long time. I'd say the chances are virtually zero. So what I would prefer to do is to suggest that if we had shallowing, we probably had an unconformity. We had an uplift event here that pushed this up above sea level. We had an unconformity and then we subsided and uh, a little bit and uh, deposited this formation, the Miocene, in a shallow water environment. But that unconformity is missing here, and that is potentially really important because unconformities are where things happen that form traps, create sources for sediments that might become reservoirs or seals, and so we really need to know about this unconformity. It could turn out to be very, very important for our total play development. So this is, I think, a really nice example of how we can use IGA to help us get on a better pathway in our reconstructions early when we see the interactive nature of our reconstructions and our conceptual models and our data. I'd like to present two uh, more detailed case studies that show the power of this technology in working on ordinary geological problems. The first one is the country of Belize, which is in Central America, right next to Guatemala and Mexico. I'll show you on a map. But what was interesting was this was a conventional basin modeling study that actually turned into IGA. And uh, we wound up making some very significant contributions to understanding the geology of that country. Whoops. No. There. Okay. Uh, here is Belize. Actually, this is the Corosal Basin in Belize. Belize is a little bigger than that. This is a study area. This is the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, Gulf of Mexico, Cuba, and so on. Um, the study area in the Yucatan plate or block in particular 
are in a very tectonically active area. You've got subduction of the Cocos Plate over here. You've got the old Gulf of Mexico lifting over here. You've got the Laramide orogenies coming down at the uh, end of the Cretaceous and early tertiary. Uh, all the way from Canada down to Mexico. You've got strike slip, transform fault movement along here. And so you would think this has been a place that has had incredible tectonics, because it certainly could have. But it turns out it didn't. It just sort of stayed high and above all this tectonic activity during its entire history. So being in the wrong place doesn't necessarily mean you're affected by all the effects in that place. Here we see the Corozal Basin of northern Belize, just north of something called the Maya Mountains, which are late Paleozoic, and they're important for part of the story. And it's right adjacent to the Petén Basin, which is mostly in Guatemala, but a little bit in Mexico. And um, in fact, the Corozal Basin is often considered to be a sub-basin of the Aten Basin. It just isn't very deep because there was never very much tectonic activity right in the block itself. That turns out to be a very important part of our story. Ignore the strat column on the left here, but the one on the right is relevant. It's a uh, typical, this is an old strat column for the Corozal Basin. It shows an old Margaret Creek formation here, uh, then a hiatus or a nonconformity, and then almost continuous deposition up to present day. A few very minor nonconformities, but almost no indication of missing time. And this is very naive. This is the kind of thing that first year geology students would think about because they want to connect all of the formations together and they forget about unconformities. In fact, before we started on the project, they had already redone a lot of the stratigraphy here, um, showing quite a different story. Here is what is taken today to be the stratigraphy. Here's the Margaret Creek that was down at the bottom. Instead, it's continuous with the hill bank, huge unconformity here, and then everything else is chopped up into pieces with more missing time than time spent in deposition. Now, this isn't surprising because this is a carbonate and hydrite filled basin. There's almost no clastics in it after the Margaret Creek. And so you think, given that these are going to be Oh, oh, before I get on to that, let me just say, um, we're going to talk about the Yalbach Formation, which has three members. Three is the oldest, two and one. And we're going to talk about the Red Bank Formation up here, which is quite young. It's near G. Um, so the Yalbach Formation, Upper Cretaceous, three members, they're very similar to each other. Y3 and Y1 are just alternating dolomite and anhydrite. Similar, well, a lot, a lot of anhydrite. Um, Y2 has almost no anhydrite. And the question is, was it not deposited or was it somehow dissolved? That's kind of a radical idea because there was so much anhydrite that we probably would have put in there, is it possible it all dissolved? Both of these environments we would expect to be shallow marine. So whatever is happening here is probably not tectonically driven. Nobody had really thought about this before. The age dating is very difficult. It's basically impossible to do with biostrat because everything is recrystallized. But recently they've been using strontium isotopes 
and had come out with an age range for the Yalbach that didn't consider any unconformities. It just showed continuous deposition of Y3, Y2, and Y1 shown in these three colors here over about a 40 million year period. So very slow, very quiet environment, extremely stable. And this is a perfect example of where you would expect eustatic control on the system. So we proposed, nobody, I guess, had really thought of it, but we just proposed, and we're just basic modelers, but we're trying to think geologically, that the three units could be separated from each other by unconformities. Those unconformities could be controlled by eustatic sea level variations, that is, lowerings of sea level, rather than by tectonics. And that the long unconformity that we proposed came after Y2, and it might have provided a mechanism, or the time at least, for anhydrite in the Y2 to have been dissolved. Because it has been noted by many workers that the dolomite there has a microbreccia character, as though it had slumped in place as perhaps anhydrite was dissolved and removed, causing the anhydrite or the dolomite to settle, basically, and losing its original texture. So that was our thesis here. And so by using our sea level curve, we were able to suggest that Y3 was deposited from about 134 to 126 million years, which is right within the range of the earliest uh, age for the Yalbach three from the strontium isotopes. And that this would have been mainly in hydrite. Then there was an unconformity during which there was not much happening. It was short and it was very dry there, so we don't really anticipate much happening and we don't see any real change in the anhydrite. Then we move to Y2, which is mainly dolomites. We either deposit only dolomite because perhaps the water was a little deeper, not as evaporitic, or we deposit a lot of anhydrite and then we move it in the subsequent much longer unconformity during this time. And then finally we deposit the Yalbach 1, which is 90% anhydrite, even richer in anhydrite than this, during this period. So that became our model. It agrees very well with the strontium isotopes, but the difference is we've now thought about including unconformities and found a way to do it. So, we can apply our geohistory plots to this problem. Here is the Yalbach 3 well. This is not the Yalbach 3 unit. It's the Yalbach 3 well, which is just a coincidence, shown with a standard geohistory plot. The sea level is flat here through time. Okay. Now, if we look at the standard geohistory plot, sorry, yeah, uh, we notice that the uplift starts at about 53 million years. Right here is when it goes emergent, when the Barton, I'm sorry, the El Cairo formation deposition ends, and we then move into an unconformity period. Okay, so that looks all right. So you've got a tectonic event ending Yalbach deposition. Okay, that's the standard interpretation everybody had applied. But if you actually look at the sea level curve, you'll notice that sea level also starts to fall at 53 million years. 
That's right here. There's our sea level curve. Here's 53 million years. And it makes me think that the real ending of Yalbach deposition was this fall in sea level, which turned it into dry land. And that turns out to be important for another reason that we'll get to in just a moment. So now to attack this problem, we use instead the eustatic geohistory plot, which is not flat. And what we notice here is that the cyan line at 53 million years starts going down and sea level falls. That leaves this land dry available for diagenetic transformations or erosion. And so that brings me to the Red Bank Formation. We now are looking at the end of the Cairo deposition here as being controlled by this drop in sea level. But there's a Dublin Bank Formation, there's a Red Bank Formation, there's an orange walk formation. And we're suspecting that these represent periods of sea level stability here, where maybe there was a bit of tectonic subsidence enough to allow the sea to come in and do some deposition. At least for the orange walk and the doubloon bank, which are demonstrably marine. The red bank is a completely different animal. It had always been considered to be marine because it was sandwiched between other marine units and nothing non-marine had ever been proposed for beliefs. The distribution today of the Red Bank Formation is very limited. It's limited to the southwestern corner of the basin, but it's present in several wells there in relatively impressive thicknesses, up to 250 meters thick here. Yeah. And so you say, well, why was it deposited just in that area? If it's marine, why would the marine waters have been way up here, far from where the water is today? And when you look at a eustatic geohistory plot for a well up in that area, we see something interesting. It's coming down, the surface is coming down here, and then the red bank is somehow being deposited in something that was cut out of this. There's some down cutting that is occurring while it's in this exposed above sea level realm. And if you think about it a little and you know what the Red Bank is, the Red Bank is the only clastic unit in the basin other than the oldest one. It is nothing but red clay. And you wonder where did red clay come from in a carbonate evaporite basin? And why does it get so thick infilling gaps or canyons in that area very locally? The answer is very simple. The underlying rock is dolomite. There has been karstification during this long exposure here. Formation of sinkholes and infilling of those sinkholes with insoluble clastics in a non-marine setting. Very logical, it's just that no one had thought about it. And so what we proposed in reconstructing was a wider original distribution of the Red Bank with some subsequent erosion of some of the thinner occurrences. You could go from zero thickness to 250 meters thickness in a matter of meters there, the way it fills in the holes. Now, that, that tells a nice story for the Yalbach 
and a different nice story for the Red Bank, and they're related because they're both related to eustatic forces. But there's an, an exploration-oriented story here, too. Belize doesn't have much petroleum that has been discovered yet. All the petroleum that has been discovered is down in this area in the Kilbank sandstone, which is upper Triassic. It's quite old, and the question is, this is the only other uh, plastic material in the basin besides the um, Red Bank Formation. So I think what happened is that you developed drainage bringing sandstones out of the Maya Mountains 200 million years ago. You deposited some sandstones that later accumulated oil. The oil had migrated probably from the west in the Petén Basin of Guatemala, up dip, been trapped here. And that the area covered by these sandstones is very similar to the area covered by the Red Bank Formation, which suggests to me that the zone of weakness, perhaps faults or fractures right at the junction between the Basin and the Maya Mountains, uh, remained a preferential fluid conduit for something like 200 million years. And so that, that was the rejuvenated pathway followed by the water flowing in Red Bank time. And so the idea is to understand this preferential surface water flow patterns developed in the late Triassic at the northwest margin of the Maya Mountains, depositing sandstone, which gives us reservoir beds and carrier beds. The flow pattern persisted at the surface through time, at least on and off, as proved by the karst topography and red bank deposition almost 200 million years later. Hydrocarbon migration through the sandstones, if they extend into the Petén Basin, or possibly the fracture system that probably is there and associated with all this, from the Petén Basin in the Corozal Basin, and that this interpretation then has implications for exploration in both Guatemala and Belize. And this all comes in just working through the basic geologic data or a basin modeling study. But it was the new ideas about the reservoirs, the provenance of the Red Bank, its character, why it's deposited there, that is the key to understanding it. And that could only come through a process like IGA, where so many different lines of evidence and so many different technologies can be brought together. This shows the picture I'm imagining. You've got right in front of the Maya Mountains, hydrocarbons coming out of the depot center in the Petén Basin, which is somewhat productive moving this way. We just don't know how big a play that could be, but it certainly makes it uh, interesting. For the final example, I'd like to go through uh, a well that is uh, already on the internet in a YouTube video. I'll do it a little shorter and a little bit differently this way. It's of the Munsterland One Well in Northwest Germany. And the whole idea here is let's build better models. This has been a well. It was drilled 60 years ago for scientific purposes. It was extensively um, studied in 6,000 meters of mostly carboniferous section, um, studied in great detail by the Germans. Uh, and it's been a classic. German students 
and academics continue to use it as a useful example for modeling. And each student publishes a slightly different model, but they all tend to look rather like this. You've got a downloping of a basin, a lot of sediment goes in and fills it up. You've got a huge uplift. Then you've got a huge downloping of some kind that creates accommodation space for Triassic age sediments. And then you have another uplift that erodes the Triassic, so it's missing today. And then you have another event that gives you deposition of the Cretaceous. So what we have today is not everything that we propose. We're proposing putting in this rock here and having some very notable tectonics in here. Well, I looked at that and I didn't really like it very much. Uh, I just think that it requires too many miracles or coincidences. Uh, so this is how I began to analyze what they had done. Veriskin foreign subsidence in front of the advancing Veriskin or Hercinian thrust in the Carboniferous here. Uh, then inversion of that as the thrust arrived at this area, creating the Veriskin Mountains, which were proposed to be quite high. Not Himalaya high, but 3,000 meters here. And then go crashing down again in a very short time and have everything subside very much in order to accommodate a fairly thick Triassic section. The justification for this would be the disintegration of Pangaea. This would be the formation of Pangaea. So Pangaea gives and Pangaea takes away. Then we have another uplift which isn't particularly well documented. And then we'd have to have some kind of pull apart or rifting or something to create the Cretaceous Basin that accumulated this. So that's what we have to work with. Now here's the setting. This is the UK right here, Ireland. Here's the French coast. And um, this is Northwest Germany. Here's Denmark. So we're talking about this area. And so if we zoom in on this little block, in the north part, we've got the Lower Saxony Basin. On the south, we've got the Rhenish Massif, which is a thrusted area, part of the uh, Hercinian, or, um, yeah. And then the Munsterland one well is right here, right in between. And so our first question is, does the geohistory should it represent the Rhenish Massif or the Lower Saxony Basin? The Rhenish Massif is a big, igneous, metamorphic complex. This is a sedimentary basin. Quite different. Which one does it look more like? There is no Triassic. The purple stuff, as we see down here, purple and blue, are the Triassic, Jurassic. There is none in the red Munsterland one well here. That's clear. If it's like the Rhenish Massif model, there never was any. If it's like the Lower Saxony Basin model, there was some. And clearly the students have favored the model in which we put in the Triassic. By the way, I've abbreviated Lower Saxony Basin as LSB. That's this up here. Okay, so here's our model with the addition of a tectonic subsidence uh, curve, which shows how strong these tectonic forces have to be. This has to be a major downwarping in front of the mountains. That seems reasonable. This has to be huge to get you so far up in the air. And then this has to be equally so to get it down again. So that's what we have to justify. One set of data that we have here is vitrinite reflectance data, which forms this incredibly beautiful profile. 
Unfortunately, it's only for the Carboniferous. They didn't do any work in the um, Cretaceous. But this was done in 1960, so a very long time ago. The data trend looks too perfect to be real. But the data are from Carboniferous coals. The work was done by world experts. And in fact, this is the part of the world where vitronite reflectance was developed as a technique. So I think the data are about as good as any data set you're ever going to see. The increase in scatter down here at extremely high maturities is normal and not uh, anything to worry about. But I think we could certainly model this part of the curve with very high confidence. Now, just pause a moment. When we create a narrative, we're always working using analogies, even if you don't realize it. Because you're thinking in your mind, either consciously or unconsciously, what does this remind me of? The trouble is, you don't always have a good analogy for your question. And in any case, some analogies are more appropriate than others. And it can be very difficult to choose a good analogy. So that, I believe, is a problem here for both of our main issues. The first is the nature of the Hercinian or um, uh, tectonic event. I think the analogy that would come to most people's minds first is the Himalayas. We know that's a suturing of two continental masses. Eurasia won and India lost. India is going down below Eurasia. It's created a huge mountain range. And that's what we would tend to think of. But if you think about it, this is a very, very strong situation. We've got India moving very fast in a straight line right into the side of Eurasia, almost like a spear or an arrow going into an animal. And that is why we get such a strong result there. When you look at the agglomeration of North America or Laurentia with all these other little plates, as well as South America, which our Washita orogeny was down here, and uh, things happening in the northwest coast of Africa here. This is where our area of interest is. It's not in the main suture between North America and South America, or North America and Africa, where we had really powerful forces acting. So I think the analogy with um, India is a false one. Instead, I would propose, this is not my proposal, but I think this is a better analogy. It's a draw. Nobody won and nobody lost. This is the two continents coming together, meeting, and they both push up somewhat, perhaps relatively high. But there isn't a clear winner and a loser. And so I don't think we need to think the mountains were quite as impressive as the Himalayas. A second point is, whenever you're having a problem, go back to what you really know and get started there. So what we know is our model with only hiatuses. We don't have any erosion or deposition proposed here. This is what we know from what is present today. And now we're going to have to take our knowledge, what we know, and expand upon that. This is how the students did it. I said, you know, I think those mountains may be too high. If we can make the mountains lower, then we don't need as much tectonic subsidence either. So I reduced the maximum elevation from 3,000 meters to about 1,500 meters. And you see, it looks quite different. It's much lower, although it still has a significant mountain. 
If I lower it to 500 meters, I don't have to do much tectonic subsidence at all to get this. So now I'm creating a more comfortable model, but I haven't changed the amount of erosion here. The amount of erosion is still about two kilometers. What the difference is, is I changed the timing of erosion. In the original model, you form mountains very quickly with no erosion. And then you did your erosion afterwards. If instead you form the mountains while you are eroding or erode while you are forming the mountains, your elevation will never become as high and you don't require nearly as much tectonic uplift. So that's what was proposed here as an alternative. So two justifications that you can use both of them, less tectonic uplift and more erosion during tectonic activity. Um, the second false analogy, I think, is that there was deposition of Triassic and Jurassic at the M1 well location. In other words, they used the Saxon, Lower Saxony Basin as their analog instead of using the Rhenish Massif. So here's our original model. Here's a model that is intermediate in the development where we removed the Triassic. We said, we don't need it. There's no proof it was here. It makes our life more difficult. And most importantly, it seems more logical that this high area would have always been high. And that the low area was the, that became the basin, the Lower Saxony Basin, was the part that was in front of the advancing thrust and was never overridden by it. By doing that, you remove the need to make it subside as fast because you don't need a basin to put the Triassic. In fact, you during Triassic time, instead of deposition, you have very slow, gradual erosion of the remaining mountains. Today, this location is at 23 meters above sea level. It is not in the mountains in any sense. So it's completely consistent with this picture. Now, to test this hypothesis quantitatively, we had some temperature data. Unfortunately, the well was drilled 60 years ago before there were any modern correction methods. But they did report both the uncorrected temperatures, shown as empty green circles, and their efforts at correcting, which are far too weak. They just bumped the temperatures up by a few degrees and never explained why they did it. And the, dark, the solid green circles are my corrections of the uncorrected data using a modern correction algorithm. I can fit those data beautifully using a basal heat flow of 58 milliwatts. There's nothing magic about that number, but it just shows the temperature data describe a very nice trend that can be easily fit. So I think we've got really good temperature data here, and I think we know the present day temperature profile quite well. When I try to model the vitreite reflectance using this thermal history with a constant basal heat flow through time of 58 milliwatts, it's fine right up at the top of the Carboniferous with about 2,000 meters of erosion. But as we move down, the calculated maturity is too low. We need higher maturity, which means higher heat flow, hotter temperatures. So our model is not bad, but it's not quite right yet. 
to improve this fit, we're going to have to rotate this trend line counterclockwise. And rotating it is going to require a higher heat flow, specifically at the time of maximum burial, which is when this maturation probably occurred. How can I justify a higher heat flow in the past? Well, if you look in the literature, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you get a gift. And what I discovered was an article discussing volcanic rocks of latest Carboniferous to early Permian age exactly when we reached maximum burial depth. Here is our Munsterland Run well, and here is the distribution of volcanic rocks. And this is probably a minimum. They may exist beyond this limit. But they're quite close to this, close enough that I feel very comfortable in saying it was probably in the, at the end of the, the, in the very late Paleozoic, a major a thermal event that was related to volcanism of some sort. And so I put in a simple and non-unique solution that fits CRO data, but is also compatible with the regional geology which is, we had this background heat flow decreasing through time to 58 milliwatts today, but it was interrupted by a period of volcanism during the late Carboniferous to Permian. And by trial and error, I just pushed that up until I got a good fit. It's not perfect in age or duration, Surely the volcanism was not constant for 80 million years, but it represents the sum of whatever volcanic events might have occurred here. And look at this really nice fit to the vitronite reflectance data that I get with that model. So we have our original model. We have what I would call my final model. Although I shouldn't call it final because I might change my mind a bit in the future, but I like it. I like it better than the other one. That's me personally. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. So to summarize, <laughs> geohistory plots have been available for a long time, over 40 years, but they haven't been routinely used and have rarely been used to maximum effect. In other words, people haven't known much what to do with them. Uh, I'm trying to show you there's a lot of things you can do with it. The static geostry plots represent a unique and ex uh, extremely powerful tool for geologic analysis. They are new and they are not being used as far as I know by anybody else. But I think they have a great future. IGA should become a routine tool in every geoscientist toolbox. This is not just for modelers. In fact, it's mostly for geologists because geologists are better equipped than modelers to deal with most of these geologic questions. Using appropriate software can greatly facilitate IGA and IGA that is linked interactively. The, the interaction is very important because IGA takes from BioStrat, it takes from SequenceStrat, but it also gives back to them in the sense of quality control. And it therefore uh, will be one of the ways in which you can QC your uh, uh, modeling work. Okay, I have one more slide here and then I have another very small philosophical section that will take five minutes. I like to use this quote, oil is found in the minds of men and women. Basically what it says, new ideas are essential if you want to have a future in exploration. If you want to do same old, same old, your life is going to be boring and eventually there won't be a place for you but there's always a place for new ideas. 
And I believe that IGA is the best available tool in the geological toolbox for generating new ideas. But before I go, I want to just shift a little bit back to the human beings and decision making and knowledge. I want to express my thanks to Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, who are behavioral psychologists engaged in studying decision making and how we know and process information. This is very important for understanding how narratives work the role they play, and how to make them better and more effective. And to Steven Pinker, who's a cognitive psychologist, for writing many books, including ones about how the brain works. These people have affected my understanding and my philosophy very, very strongly and deserve a lot of credit. In fact, Daniel Kahneman's book, he was a Nobel Prize winner as a, in economics as a psychologist. Um, this book was a bestseller, but it's also a wonderful book. And if you don't read anything else, read the 50 to, first 50 to 100 pages of this book, uh, and you will learn some amazing stuff. Related to how our brains process and interpret information, we have everybody has something called System 1 which is always working, kind of like a scanner, radar scanner in an airport. Uh, it's expert in creating narratives. It's doing it continuously. It provides links among various types of, you could say data, but I prefer to say information because much of it isn't really hard data. It's just impressions and thoughts and so on. And System 1 is very sensitive in recognizing anomalies. So it has some really important positive features shown in dark blue. But in the turquoise, it has some real weaknesses. It is and was during the evolution of human beings over 500 million years, the foundation for primitive, that means life or death, decision making. Do I run? Do I fight? Do I go up in a tree or do I go in a hole? Things like that. Uh, it is non-quantitative. It doesn't say how fast you should run. It just says run. It ignores questions related to data quality. So a big noise and a bad noise can sound equally scary. And one may mean something very different than the other. It doesn't ever ask questions of whether this piece of information should be included or not. And therefore, the association system one creates can be unreliable. So we don't want to be depending on system one for everything. We want to use the best parts of the amazing system one uh, machinery but we don't want to ask it to do the things it is not set up to do. We also, as human beings, and probably only as human beings, that is, no other animal has this, have something called system two in a different part of the brain. It is quantitative and it can consider probabilities. It's capable of evaluating the quality of information. That is part of its character. It can understand cause and effect relationships. It supplies information to system one. That's part of the normal human decision making. And it is the foundation for modern decision making. And by that I mean more complex questions. Not do I fight or do I run, but should I invest my money in this proposal or that proposal? Which one has the better chance of success? Questions like that that would never happen a million years ago when you're just trying to stay alive, but which are very important in the modern world. So we must have a very strong system too, and it must be very active and very 
full of information. The problem is system two only functions when requested by system one. And Kahneman even calls it lazy. It doesn't want to do the hard mental work of solving all these problems if system one can handle the problem. And creation of narratives is, is not its interest. It's interested in facts, little bits and pieces, not in a story. So I think you can see that system two should be handling the data, quality, numbers, probabilities, relationships among the data, and system one should be putting it together in a great story. So my solution is, and this is something I like to do in my work, and I like to pass on to people who are thinking about things like IGA, is that system two should focus on creating better units or building blocks that will then be passed on to system one to create the narratives. Let system two do all the interpretation of those, pass them on to system one and let system one tell the story. Thank you for your attention. I hope it's been interesting and stimulating and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Doc, for your very, very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I think we can move to the question. Is it okay? Yes, sure. Okay, uh, the first question from Mr. Andy Mardianza. You can turn on your audio. Okay, okay hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Hello. Clear. Thank you. Hello, my Paul. Yeah. Hello. My name is Andy. Andy. I'm geoscientist at PT Pertamina IP. I have three questions. The first, how to build correlation between subsidence rate value and tectonic event? Is there any range for subsidence rate for certain tectonic event? And do you have a burial history standard as analog or guidance to interpret tectonic event history from our burial history? The second is when you started the presentation in the early, you saw a burial history at the middle jurassic age burial history so uplifting even but paleobathymetry existed it means that there is depositional event my question right. is what kind of event that could uh, rise the burial curve and the last is the uh, about the sea level change i agree with you that the sea level changes uh, through geological, geological time how to consider sea level uh, value to reconstruct paleobathymetry in our burial history. In my opinion, there is a possibility that, be, that uh, by adding the uh, uh, sea level value to paleobathymetry uh, value could change the bathymetry level. Uh, for, example, for example, if we add it, if we put sea level uh, 100 meter, uh, we can uh, um, move inner narratic to middle narratic okay thank you very much okay uh well let me let me start with our third question just because i remember it a little better um the uh first of all you need to have a sea level curve a eustatic sea level curve either one that uh you get from software like nova or something that your company uses or something that you find published somewhere. So you need a sea level curve and they're not going to all be exactly the same, that's for sure. Um, so, so that's one thing. Now another thing is uh, sea level curves only tell you what is happening with sea level. They don't tell you directly about water depth. The water depth uh, will vary from location to location. Even with a high sea level stand, some places will still be by land. Uh, so the water depth is hard to predict. That's why we tend to look for information from sedimentology and biostratigraphy 
it will help tell us whether it's inner neuritic or outer neuritic or um, that sort of thing. So I use generally a combination of whatever is available. When you're doing basin modeling, you can't order the type of data that you want. You take what you are able to find or they give to you and you do the best you can with it. So if I had uh, a sea level curve that said that sea level is 100 meters higher than today, I would tend to think, well, there's a pretty good chance that something that is marginal could be underwater and the water could be deeper because 100 meters is fairly large. Um, but it doesn't tell me much more than that. So I, I can't go too far without the data. But data about water depth can come from a lot of different sources. Uh, the nature of sediments, you don't always have to have bio stratigraphy data, and you certainly don't always have to have it exactly from the location you're modeling. Uh, nearby locations can often be very, very helpful. Okay, uh, uh, just to refresh my memory, what was your first question? How to build the uh, correlation between subsidence rate, value, and tectonic event? Is okay, there yeah. Any yeah. For it? Well, you have to kind of get calibrated a little bit. Lifting is a very, potentially very strong. Uh, large amounts of tectonic subsidence can occur, and they can occur pretty fast. Um, there's a paper, probably the best thing I can think of to really understand and appreciate rift is the paper, I believe it's in 1977, by Parsons and Slater. And uh, that is one, you know, it really talks about what happens in a rift, like when you form an ocean where you don't have any sedimentation. So it's about the purest example you can find of the character of rifts in general. Uh, and these are rifts which went all the way to successful completion. That is, they formed oceanic crust. Now, real rifts sometimes are much weaker than that, so the amount of subsidence and the amount of, uh, and the rates of subsidence will be much lower. If you can get calibrated to an extreme case, like formation of the Atlantic Ocean, or the Pacific Ocean or any place that has oceanic crust, then you'll have a pretty good sense for how to scale down to other uh, rifts that aren't as successful or complete. We find many rifts in Southeast Asia or extensional basins that don't go all the way to uh, oceanic crust, so that approach is use useful. More than that, I can't really give you a lot of guidelines, but the Persons and Slater paper uh, would be very useful. And uh, if you write me an email or something, I can send you a reference to it. All right. Thank you, Paul. In okay, and what, what was the second question? Uh, about the rural history at, uh, at, uh, when you started the presentation. Uh, yeah, right. You're talking about the central graben, I think. Well, well, I said it started the the, the central graben, but uh, paleobathymetry existed. Uh, yes. Well, the start of your model is not always the start of its history. You have some basins which uh, your deepest sediment is indeed the first sediment that was ever deposited there, but other places the basin may have had a multiple basin history, multiple phases. And so in some of those cases, you may arbitrarily stop at the Middle Cretaceous or the beginning of the Jurassic or the end of the Miocene. I mean, it just depends on what basin you're talking about. And in some cases, there would have been uh, things happening before the period of interest. I don't think it's bad to start your model a little bit before the time that you're interested in. It helps avoid what we call edge effects. 
when you already have it in a context, uh, if you can. There's no hard and fast rule about, about this, and certainly not everything starts out on dry land. Uh, some basins form in marine settings, uh, the Andaman Basin, for example. So, okay, thank you for your question. Okay, Questions. Well, okay, thank you, Mas Andi, for the questions. Uh, we can move to the next question from Chatur Chayaningsi. You can turn on your audio, please. Thank you, Wepos. Yeah. Next question from Chatur. Yes, so, I'm waiting. Oh, I think she already left, left the meeting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Well, okay. go on to a new person. Okay, next from Sheikh Maulana. Oh, I think I already left the meeting also. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, next question from Yudis. Okay, Yudis, you can have a uh, question to Wapos directly. Okay, uh, thank you for the opportunity, Ricky and Melinda. Yeah. Uh, hello, Doc. It's very interesting presentations, to be honest. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I want to ask about uh, feature unit reflectance calibration here, which, used, which you used in Nova software. Right. Um, what kind of calibration model do you use to validate or to fit between our fit unit reflectance data with the model? Uh, maybe, for example, in another software, we usually use Sweeney Burnham, ECRO, or EC Doc Lake RO from Burnham, or Basin RO from Nielsen in 2015. So, what do you think in Nova software? Or maybe do you have your own calibration model uh, in here? Okay, that's a good and useful question, and it's perfectly timed <laughs> because because um, we use Easy Person RO, which is a standard one from Burnham and Sweeney, yes. 1990. Uh, but we are just in the process of installing the uh, Easy Person RO DL, which is the one that Alan Burnham developed with two other people. Uh, I think about three years ago. And uh, I don't have a favorite yet. I have always used Easy Percent RO. Now that we will very soon, in fact, I on my desk have a version with that in it, um, but it's not ready for release yet. I'm going to get more familiar with the Easy Percent RO DL and uh, see what I think of it. Easy Percent RO DL is virtually identical to Basin RO, except that Basin RO terminates at a lower vitronite reflectance value. So I don't feel there's any need to use that one because uh, Easy Percent RO DL will do everything it does plus a little bit more. Okay, uh, thank you for your uh, answer. Can I uh, have uh, one question uh, last? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, in your presentation, there are several erosion events in your integrated geohistory. Uh, according to your opinion, what's the best solution to predict or calculate erosion? Uh, where do you get a perfect data for erosion thickness? Is it from edge gap between the deposition or from seismic or from uh, porosity maybe or from something? No. The, the simple answer to that is yes. <laughs> you, get, you get data about erosion, or I would prefer to call it information, because none of it, very little, really reaches the level where you could call it data. Um, you can get it from a lot of places. You can get it from nearby wells where the formation was preserved. You can get it from cross sections. You can get it from seismic interpretations. They all involve some kind of assumption about what is um, true, what is a good analogy, how good this analogy is compared to what I'm working on. So there's no perfect answer. Um, there has been a lot of work uh, 40 years ago on using uh, porosity as a way of, or log, uh, densities and that sort of thing uh, as a way of estimating amounts of erosion. 
I don't think they're quantitatively very helpful. Uh, things like vitreoid reflectance can certainly help. So can things, other thermal indicators like mission track. Um, they, they, a lot of different things can play roles. I don't want to say that there's one magic bullet because they all have problems. Some have very serious limitations. For example, fish and track really isn't any good at all for small erosional events because it requires a large amount of cooling equivalent to at least 500 meters of erosion. So uh, you just do the best you can. And I don't say I'm going to use this and not use that. If I have both kinds of data, I'm going to use both kinds of data. Okay, thank you for your answer. No? And I think the best thing is when you propose some erosion, look at it in terms of rates. If I, if I say I've got 500 meters of erosion first, I must deposit 500 meters of extra sediment. So when did that happen and am I happy with the rate? And then I've got to erode it. How much time do I have available? What is my erosion mechanism? How happy I am? Am I with that possibility? Everything has to fit together. You have to say, okay, I eroded this amount. It's a very soft rock, so erosion should be fast. There are strong erosional forces occurring here because it's not lithified, because it's very wet, because the mountains are high. All of those would be good justifications for rapid erosion. I don't want to go out on the craton of an old Precambrian system and start proposing erosion rates of 200 meters per million years. That is not going to happen. It's more like two meters per million years, uh, or maybe less. So you have to look at the situation and find something that seems reasonable, because in the end, it's part of your story. And somebody is always going to find the weak part of your story and start asking you questions about it. So you want to do as well as you can at thinking about all the things that could be affected by this decision. If I put in a number of 500 versus 1,000, what does it do to this concept, that concept, that number, and so on, until you find something that you you're willing to really say, I believe this. Okay, thank you for your uh, answer. No. Okay. Okay, thank you, Yudis. Uh, and then we have the last question from Pak Ekonur. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for opportunities. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, from your, uh, based on your experience and opinion, uh, what is the la, the location the, the most location the most challenging location that you have been uh, that you has uh, explored and more attractive uh, get more, more attractive result and challenge the most challenging for you sir the most challenging location for me yeah <sighs> I think for a number of reasons, areas with thrust faults are very difficult. Part of it is a software problem. Uh, part of it is a data problem because you have to reconstruct the history of movement. And much of that depends upon things that don't have too much to do with basin modeling, although some of it Basin modeling can interact, especially with things like fish and track data, interactively to, to work on problems like that. But I think trusted areas are uh, the most difficult, most challenging. Other than that, I think unconformities that are very large, where you've got a lot of time missing and when there was probably a lot of erosion, are very challenging because when you have a lot of time, you have a lot of possibilities. 
that could have happened. There could be many events hidden inside long uncon unconformities. And you will never know for sure, but if you think about them hard, maybe you can come up with some creative reconstructions that will be better than anything anyone has proposed before. Uh, this is something we did in the Permian Basin, where we had those nine layers of Cretaceous that were eroded. That was a very big project to reconstruct all that and do it systematically and scientifically. We had fortunately help on that from a world expert, but uh, that type of thing is very challenging, but it's also the most interesting you feel really good at the end and the potential for new discoveries of new ideas, new information, even new exploration plays is greater. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Anyone want to have a question? We can we still have time for one more slot. <laughs> Okay. I just want to say something. Oh, that's okay. So, Andy, silakan. Yeah. Well, in 2016, I requested demo license of Nova Software. Thank you very much uh, for sending the demo license. I have tried to use it on my work. The steps in the software are very clear uh, uh, and very user friendly, I think. Thank the, you. Yeah, the rural history is very detailed as well, and I'm really waiting uh, that you could continue to develop it for uh, 2D and 3D model. Well, I'm afraid I'm too old to do that. I'm not going to uh, go further with it. I'm happy with the 1D. I dedicated my career to working on 1D. But what I would I think is that most of the important questions can be worked out in 1D, and then you can build 2D or 3D models in existing software and uh, get the benefits of NOVA and real IGA work by focusing first on the 1D and uh, making it a high priority. Right now, many modelers do not understand that if they don't really work hard on the 1D and build the best models, their 2D and 3D will be inferior. And so they, they, they make mistakes by thinking 1D is too easy, too simple, too old. In fact, it is where most of the learning goes and where most of the new ideas are going to come from. Okay, Doug. I think uh, that will end our discussions. Uh, I think we will close the. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> thank you for for your time. This is the second time you possibly have you uh, in this Fossi talk, and we are very very honored to have you. You have a very excellent and very clear presentations as always. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, on behalf of FOSI, I would like to thank you. Thank you. If you want to share something for the next FOSI talk, I will very welcome. And, and then... Uh, okay, <laughs> we'll see. And, and, and then as, as I said before, I will uh, uh, share this uh, recording record to the into the YouTube video. I will let you know better. Yeah. Yes, please do. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doc. Uh, and, and then Melinda, uh, you have something to add? To add? <clears throat> Uh, no, maybe for me, just uh, thank you, Advance uh, Douglas. Uh, see you again in another occasion. And thank you very much for all participants. Uh, for Douglas Webless, uh, have a good rest. Late night already. Thank you so much for sharing in FOSI. Uh, okay, thank you for the opportunity.